Okay, um, welcome to the international online lecture series Feminisms in the Digital Age, Transnational Activism in Germany and Beyond. Um, it's a great honor to take part in this lecture series with Hester Baer, with Maria Steele, Carrie smith Prey, Pina Tusco, um, and my name is Christina Scharf. I'm a lecturer here at King's College London, so I'm in London. I'm actually recording this lecture and there's nobody in the room. I guess it's all virtual, um, so that's a bit strange, but I'm going to get used to it, I'm sure. So my lecture today, uh, which will be the first in the lecture series, is called Starting the Debate, Framing Contemporary Engagements with Feminism. And really what I'd like to do in today's lecture is to take a step back, actually, to look at the wider cultural context in which digital feminisms are embedded. So rather than looking at specific forms or manifestations of contemporary feminist protest cultures, I'll focus on wider socioeconomic and cultural trends and currents. So we'll hear lots more about the kind of um, and forms of digital activisms that are going on at the moment um, in the lectures to come and also in the round table at the end. Um, I, however, will take a step back and to look at the wider cultural context. Or at least I try to do that. Of course, such an endeavor is always limited in one way or another. So to start with a few disclaimers, when I talk about feminism, I consider feminism as something contingent. So how we understand feminism, how we define feminism, how we relate to feminism may well depend on our historic context, so which time we are in, whether it's today or whether it was in the 70s or the 1920s or whenever and where we are based in the world. And also, of course, our positionality in relation to gender, in relation to class, in relation to race and sexuality. Um, in my lecture today, I'm gonna focus on the German context, but also a bit on the UK. Um, I'm German, as I'm sure you can hear, but I'm based in the UK and have been for a very long time. And I should also say that my analysis is informed mainly by Anglo-American academic debates. Um, I do read German academic literature as well, um, but today I'm going to draw on a lot of Anglo-American academic theory. And more specifically, the kind of cultural trends that I'd like to talk about today are post-feminism, neoliberalism, and difference. So of course I go into them in more detail to explain to you what I mean by them. But post-feminism, of course, is a course that has been various, is a term that has been variously defined. So I'm going to explain briefly what I mean when I talk about feminism. Neoliberalism, very similarly, <laughs> is also a term that is being very widely used in different contexts by different disciplines. So again, I'm going to explain how I use the concept and how it relates to digital feminisms. You might well ask yourself that. And then difference um, in today's lectures, I'm mainly going to talk about difference in relation to ethnicity and race and sexuality. Um, and I hope that you'll enjoy the lecture. Okay, so briefly, I want to start with uh, what's been going on in Germany in relation to feminism and also beyond. And of course, that's a particular story I'm telling that again can be contested. Um, but based on readings I've done and research, uh, we could argue that until the li late 2000s, so around 2006, 2007, 2008, feminism was relatively absent from public debates in Germany. So while there was an active women's movement in West Germany in the 1970s and the 1980s, and of course also during the Weimar Republic before then, and also in East Germany in the 1980s, um, the 90s and the early 2000s were described as quieter by several authors. And this changed um, quite dramatically, perhaps, depending on your viewpoint. In 2006, um, you may remember that there was a debate on demographic changes. Feminism was blamed for the comparatively low German birth rate or birth rate in Germany. Um, apparently, women didn't want to have children anymore, and that caused a range of problems. This media debate, as you can imagine, was highly problematic in various respects. Um, for example, for the way it described feminism, but also for the rather nationalistic attention to birth rates in Germany. 
Um, so this debate, unsurprisingly perhaps, sparked a kind of um, new feminism, if you want to call it that. A range of authors published books, and there was also a resurgence of feminist activism in Germany. So um, if we think of books, and they are from a range of political perspectives and colors, um, we can think of Charlotte Roach's Wetlands or The Alter Mädchen von, von Mel Brown, Susanne Klingner, Barbara Schreidel, Silvana koch mehren Schwestern, Streitschrift für einen neuen Feminismus, Sonja Eisner, Hot Topic, Pop Feminismus heute, and a bit earlier than that, Thea Dorns, Die neue Klasse. And also, um, there we saw the emergence of a range of blogs, Mythy Magazine, of course, Hashtag Aufschrei in, uh, in 2013, and several activist projects. And the way, actually, in which these activist projects intersect with transnational forms of activism, such as Slugwalk, um, the highly contested women movement, and indeed critical responses to it, Pussy Riot, and of course other digital forms of um, activism that we're going to hear more about in the lectures to come. There were also similar trends in the UK, actually. So in the late 2000s, we can also see a kind of resurgence of feminist activism there, and also popular books about feminism. I'm thinking here of Kat Banyard's The Equality Illusion, Natasha Walters' Living Dolls, or Catherine Redfern's and Christine Arms' Reclaiming the F Word. And of course, also a resurgence of activist projects such as Object, the F Word, London Feminist Network, UK Feminista, Reclaim the Night Marches, Slugwalk, the Everyday Feminist, the Everyday Sexism Project, would be great if it was the Everyday Feminism Project, no, the Everyday Sexism Project, and so on. So this is one story that we can tell about the wider context in relation to feminism. And so now on to the first kind of wider cultural current that I want to discuss, which is post-feminism. As I've said before, uh, the concept of post-feminism is contested and has been defined in many different ways. So you may well have heard it in one context or another. If you are a bit confused as to what exactly it means, don't worry, a lot of people are. So I should be very clear that I'm using, I'm sorry, that I'm using Rosalind Gill's and Angela McRobbie's um, excellent work on post-feminism. Um, Rosalind Gill, for example, argues that, amongst other things, um, post-feminism relates to the entanglement of feminist and anti-feminist ideas. And similarly, Angela McRobbie um, talks about a logic where feminism has achieved the status of common sense, so we are all aware of feminism, we all believe that men and women should be treated equal, equally, but that feminism, despite uh, being widely accepted, is refuted and almost hated. Um, and she, in fact, argues that this is a double entanglement. So because feminism is widely taken into account, it's also rejected, or this is exactly what permits it to be repeatedly discredited, repudiated, and regarded as redundant. So, for example, we can often find claims in a Western context, and I'm going to come back to that, um, that feminism is no longer needed, um, that it was this really valuable movement in the past, these kind of claims, thank God these women did this, um, but, no, but now we no longer need feminism, it's no longer necessary. So that would kind of be um, a typical post-feminist argument. And you might well ask yourself, what the concept of post-feminism, what does it have to do with contemporary feminist activism, be that digital or non-digital? Um, and that's a very good question. Of course, I'm not arguing that feminism is being repudiated everywhere, because that would mean there, you know, that there was no feminist activism. But I think that post-feminism, that the concept still raises interesting questions about how we as feminists, if we all identify as feminists, um, or as feminist activists engage with feminist legacies and the feminist past. Is there a critical engagement with the feminist past? Is there a knowing engagement with the feminist past? Is there, for example, you know, reference to past activist project, projects or perhaps older feminist literature? I'm not saying it necessarily has to be feminist literature. 
but how do we relate to the feminist past that came before the present? And I'm asking these questions because we can often see in feminist activisms as well, not only of course, but also in feminist activisms or feminist texts, um, repudiations of particular feminist figures. So for example, what I detected in some of the books um, that I just mentioned to you, the new German feminism, so ranging from Alpha Mädchen, uh, so ranging from Alpha Mädchen um, and Wetlands to Neue Deutsche Mädchen and so on, that there was a repudiation of the feminist figure of the man-hater. So these authors um, emphasized repeatedly that, they're not, that they were not one of those. And we have to ask ourselves what these repudiations do. Um, I come back to that point, to say the least, they reaffirm heteronormative conventions. Um, but we can also um, ask ourselves more broadly uh, what the stories that we tell about the feminist past do. Um, and I'm thinking here in particular of um, Claire Hemming's excellent work, um, Why Stories Matter, um, The Political Grammar of Feminist Theory. Um, that's something to bear in mind. So I think the concept of post-feminism is still useful. Um, like I said, not to argue that it means that feminism is repudiated or rejected in every context. It isn't, otherwise there wouldn't be any feminist activism. But to ask ourselves still how we engage with the feminist past as activists or as academics or as theorists or more generally as people who identify as feminists. Okay. So the second theme that I want to discuss, as I said, is the notion of neoliberalism. So similar to post-feminism, neoliberalism is a contested term. Again, it's widely used across time and also across space and across um, different disciplinary contexts. So if you speak to an economist and discuss neoliberalism, they may have a different view of it than a sociologist or a person who does cultural studies. So when I talk about neoliberalism, really I draw on Foucauldian accounts of neoliberalism. And this means, in short, that it's based on the work of the French philosopher Michel Foucault, um, who argued that neoliberalism was an art of government, so a form of exerting power through autonomous active citizens who engage in the pursuit of personal fulfillment and who make their life meaningful through acts of choice. So what does that mean? Often under neoliberalism we find that individuals are represented um, as entrepreneurs. So that the logic of entrepreneurialism has been extended beyond the sphere, of, beyond the economic sphere, beyond the sphere of the market to encompass several, um, if not almost all areas of our lives. So this is what Wendy Brown means when she argues neoliberalism normatively constructs and interpolates individuals as entrepreneurial actors in every sphere of life. So this means that you can optimize and make more efficient certain areas of your life, such as, of course, your work life, but perhaps also your intimate relationships, friendships, your social life, and so on, your health, your appearance, um, all these kind of areas of life can be subjected to an entrepreneurial logic. Um, and to use Paul Duguay's description here, entrepreneurial subjects then are active, not passive. So you take charge of what's going on in your life. Um, you are self-reliant. You don't rely on others, so to say. Um, and you are accountable and responsible for your own actions. And the notion of responsibility is very important in the wider neoliberal context. Um, basically relating to how individuals become responsibilized for a whole range um, of things in their lives, such as having employment, being in employment, being of good health, um, including things that I would argue are not always in our control. But again, individuals are often under neoliberal rhetoric positioned as being responsible for all these kind of things. So again, we can ask ourselves, how does this relate to feminism? Well, more broadly under neoliberalism, which I would argue is a prevalent cultural trend, of course it's not the only one, but I think it does permeate and affect our lives, and by our I mean in contemporary Western society, 
our lives in many different ways. One of the ways is, for example, that there tends to be a focus on the individual, um, and this goes, um, this often goes hand in hand with a disavowal, so a kind of denial of wider structural constraints and a pronounced form of individualism. So, for example, I recently conducted a research project which looked at something slightly different. It looked at the politics of cultural work, so at the politics of what it's like to work in the cultural sector, and um, I interviewed classically trained musicians, and all of them were female, and gender inequalities are very pronounced in the classical music sector, as are racial and class inequalities. So I did interviews, and I asked my research participants about these inequalities, and most of them thought that there weren't an issue, that as an individual you could make it. Um, you just had to work hard, you had to be well connected maybe, but you could kind of do it. And I think that's a very individualistic notion, so there's a strong reliance on the individual, but because of the disavowal of broader social structures and the way they may affect us, um, I also read this as something neoliberal. And also in neoliberalism, like I've said, there's an emphasis on individual responsibility and personal accountability. So to be a morally worthy subject, and again, Wendy Brown writes about that, one must deal with opportunities and constraints individually and independently. And this can mean, for example, as I've shown in my previous work and research, that feminism is rejected because it's a collective movement or often perceived of as a collective movement. If, however, individuals are called upon to negotiate and manage difficulties and opportunities individually and independently, then a movement such as feminism with its associations of collectivism may be rejected. So neoliberalism might mean that it becomes more difficult to claim feminism and to identify as a feminist. But neoliberalism has also affected forms of feminist activism. Um, and I think this is why it's important to raise it in today's lecture. Sorry, I'm just waiting for a plane to pass in case you can hear it. Okay, so this is why I think it's important to um, raise the notion of neoliberalism in today's lecture. We, for example, know from work, um, and I'm thinking here of the uh, journal Perspectives on Politics, um, there has been work on the American women's movement and so-called choice feminism, looking at how neoliberal ideas have kind of informed contemporary feminist activism and discussions, at least in certain respects. So choice feminism, for example, would emphasize the ability to make choices um, and emphasize individual women's ability to make choices. And as long as you make a choice, no matter what that choice might entail politically for yourself but also for others, it would be considered a feminist act. This is just one way in which neoliberalism has been kind of discussed in the context of what's going on in contemporary uh, feminist debates and activism. But also in my work, when I read some of this new German feminism literature, I found that neoliberal ideas and concepts did inform some of the texts. Not all of them, of course, but some of them. And I'm thinking here in particular of Silvana Kochmeren's work. I mean, that might not be surprising, given that she was from the FDP party. Um, but also Gia Dawan's work, who emphasized that everybody could be a member of the F class, as she called it, no matter where they are from. So there was, again, a disregard for broader structural constraints. And actually, even in the book, um, The IPA Meeting, um, which was interesting, um, because neoliberalism was explicitly rejected and criticized in that book, and yet often the solutions that um, the author suggested were very individualist again, and putting emphasis on individual responsibility. And then, of course, if you think back of more recent transnational debates, um, Cheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, has been uh, popular and also widely critiqued. I'm not going to go into this now. Um, and so I think neoliberalism is again another concept that is worth thinking about and applying if you think about contemporary uh, 
forms of digital feminist activism, and we will hear more about that in Hester Bear's lecture. Okay, so, so much about the notion of neoliberalism. To come to the third issue I want to discuss in relation to contemporary feminist movements. And this is the issue of difference and othering. So of course, as I'm sure many of you are aware, differences amongst women in relation to racial and ethnic background, for example, as well as to class and sexuality, disability, to name just a few, um, have been key to feminist debates in the past and in the present. They continue to provoke discussions, um, and that is important. And we have to ask ourselves how the issue of difference is negotiated and addressed in contemporary forms of activism, of feminist activism. So for example, is there a focus on the experiences of a privileged group of women? As I found in more mainstream popular debates about feminism in Germany, that um, the woman that is often implicitly talked about is white, middle class, and heterosexual, because often what public debates about feminism in Germany are about, um, at least following uh, one media analysis that I did, um, is in part uh, the difficulty of combining having a career with having children. And though that might be difficult, this means that the debate focuses only on the experiences of a particular group of women. So we do have to ask ourselves who is being spoken about, who is being discussed, who is being represented in debates about feminism, but also in particular forms of feminist activism. Also, is there a limited engagement with differences amongst women? Is there, for example, lip service being paid? Are there passing remarks to other women? Um, so there might be claims like, yes, I can't speak for all women, but and then generalizing remarks are being made. So we have to ask ourselves critically how the issue of difference is negotiated in contemporary feminist activism. And I'm raising this in particular because um, in recent years, and for a much longer time, I'll come back to that, um, but in recent years in particular, feminist democracy, eh, not feminist, Western <laughs> democracies have often positioned themselves as post-feminist. And post-feminist here means something slightly different. So as societies who are no longer in need of feminism because they, have, you know, they, have, they are past that. So it's more of a simple temporal narrative than the narrative on post-feminism that I spoke about. So the idea is that kind of here in the West, uh, we, whoever that we is, we have had feminism, we dealt with those issues, we are no longer traditional, men and women are treated equally now, and it's all good. Um, I don't share this view, obviously, um, but what I want to talk about here is that this view often um, contrasts sharply with portrayals of so-called other cultures, um, especially since September 11th, and these other cultures in contemporary debates often relate to Muslim communities and societies. And Saba Mahmoud and many other authors have written critically about this, about this and just to uh, quote Saba Mahmoud, she argues that representations of Muslim women as incomparably bound by the unbreakable chains of religious and patriarchal oppression have become um, predominant in the post 9-11 era. And so, what I think we should ask ourselves is to what extent can similar trends be detected in contemporary discourses about feminism and some forms of feminist activism. Some forms, of course, not all forms of feminist activism. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, and we can see that, I think, in contemporary debates about feminism. So, for example, you may recall um, <laughs> contemporary media coverage um, in relation to sexism and patriarchy, but I'm thinking here in particular of uh, uh, <laughs> um, Christina Schroeder's um, engagements with feminism that was several years ago now, but she rejected feminism quite strongly in relation to a contemporary German context, whatever she meant by that. Um, but then she embraced it when it came to, and I'm quoting, 
Um, we, have, we have fought long for women's equal status, so now suddenly she included herself as a feminist. Now we have to defend it against certain radical Muslim groups. So she used warlike language, claimed feminism very strongly when before she kind of, I mean you may know this, she was very critical of feminism. And um, so this is just one example of public debates uh, in recent years, but there are many, many more. And then of course we have to ask ourselves how these debates are also lived out in contemporary feminist activism. And I know that some of the lectures we'll hear are gonna talk about this in more detail. Um, I wanna take a step back and again problem problematize these engagements with differences, especially around the construction um, of particular groups, Muslim women, the othering of Muslim women and what that does. And this is where the slide comes in. So these constructions of the rest as progressive and the rest as non-progressive are neo-colonial. So this is what I meant that they aren't entirely new. There's a history to that, it's a colonial history. And they're neo-colonial if we remind ourselves that colonialism rationalized itself on the basis of the inferiority of non-Western cultures, which was most manifest, so it was argued, and this is a quote again from Saba Mahmoud, in their patriarchal customs and practices from which indigenous women had to be rescued through the agency of colonial rule. So you can see resonances here, which is why I think these discourses are neo-colonial, othering discourses can be neo-colonial, and why we have to engage critically with them. But there's more an additional and not necessarily mutually exclusive reasons. These discourses also preempt critical solidarities amongst women. Um, because they create divisions between particular groups of women. And similarly, um, they fail to allow for differences in hierarchies, both, with, both within the West and those countries that are designated as other. So suddenly, as a woman who might have grown up in Germany, you are positioned and characterized as empowered, perhaps, whereas if you happen to grow up in a country that is designated as other and traditional and patriarchal, you are positioned in a very different way, as perhaps disempowered, as a passive victim of patriarchy, and so on. And I, for example, found this a lot also in other research I've done, where I've asked a diverse group of young women about their views on gender and feminism. And these discourses did come up without my prompting, often very uncritically reproducing the notion that other women had to be rescued from patriarchal rule whereas in contemporary Western context, everything was fine, so to speak. So these discourses don't allow for differences amongst women in relation to class, in relation to race, in relation to ethnicity, both within Western context and other contexts. And they also essentialize and reify culture as an all-determining structuring force. So what do I mean by this? Um, again, when I think back of the interviews I conducted with a diverse group of young women, discussing gender equality, feminism, and so on. Western culture was often represented as something you can step in and out of, so it was fluid. You know, you took on what you wanted to, but the rest you just um, did away with. Whereas cultures in countries designated as other were often constructed as all determining forces. And Wendy Brown again has written very well on that, how these different notions of culture lend themselves to establishing differences and to reifying culture. So to say that we have to be critical of these discourses and explore them in the context of contemporary engagements with feminism. But of course difference also relates to other axes of difference. Here I want to talk about sexuality and heteronormativity. As I've mentioned to you briefly before, um, I found in my research that feminists are often associated with men-haters, with lesbian women and women who look unfeminine. And this has been the case historically, so if you read books about the feminist movement in the UK and Germany, for example, in the 1920s, but also 1950s and so on, you find similar debates how contemporary feminists distance themselves from other feminists on the basis that these other feminists were unfeminine or lesbian or spinsters maybe in the 1920s, the notion of the spinster was more widely used. We can also sometimes find it in academic feminism, this kind of rejection of the figure of the feminist, um, but also in contemporary forms of activism. Um, 
So again, and this is what I'd mentioned to you briefly, when I engaged uh, with a range of popular books that embraced feminism in Germany in the late 2000s, I found that there was, um, in some books, a lot of emphasis placed on emphasizing that I'm not like those feminists. I do like men. I'm not unfeminine. I wear lipstick. I have long hair. And there's lots of stuff to discuss in relation to that. Um, the main thing to, for me uh, at the moment is that these associations are structured by heteronormative conventions and that they also can reproduce them uncritically. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it do when we reject the figure of the feminists, when we emphasize, no, we are not like them on the basis that we might be more conventionally feminine, whatever that means. Does it produce and reproduce heterosexual conventions? And if so, I think, again, we have to engage with this critically. So this is another facet in which difference may manifest itself in contemporary engagements with feminism. I have found that, and again, it's something we can discuss further in this lecture series. Okay, I'm just gonna check the time. Um, good, so I'm just a minute over, so I'll conclude very briefly. These are just some conclusions. So I argued in today's lecture that engagements with feminism are marked by certain cultural trends. I spoke about post-feminism, I spoke about neoliberalism and negotiations of difference. I argued that post-feminism and neoliberalism are variously defined concepts. I used post-feminism to kind of indicate the way in which feminism is often taken into account and rejected at the same time. Um, and to ask ourselves how contemporary feminist activism engages with past and previous forms of activism and feminist critique. Neoliberalism similarly is a complex context, goes hand in hand often with an emphasis on the individual and individual responsibility. And again, we could see how certain forms of feminist activism in the past um, have incorporated some neoliberal ideas. And again, I think that's something we should challenge and think about critically. And lastly, I talked about the negotiations of difference, particularly in relation to ethnicity, and but also in relation to sexuality and heteronormativity, and again, called for a critical engagement with those issues. So of course, the cultural trends I discussed in this lecture, post-feminism, neoliberalism, and how difference is being negotiated with and discussed these cultural trends are by no means all you know, that we should discuss or that we can discuss in relation to contemporary engagements with feminism. But I have found them um, central. They kept popping up in the research I've done over the last few years on engagements with feminism, and that's why I discussed them here. So this is to leave you with this lecture. I hope you found it clear. Um, and.